almost a week ago today, I spoke to new students right after you had arrived. Uh, I spoke to you and your families about some of the things that Amherst values. And I emphasized the value we have placed on educational opportunity, on diversity, on creating a diverse intellectual community in which all three terms in that phrase, diverse intellectual community, have as much meaning as the middle one has always had. And the value we place on friendship, understood not only as a private good, but a civic necessity. And you were then asked to take part in a poll which yielded this word cloud that I think many of you have at your seats. And the word cloud is the result of your having listed the three words from my orientation speech that you found most compelling. And so we can all see from the word cloud to the extent that we understand word clouds what you emphasized most, what compelled you. And clearly, friendship, understood not only as a private good, but as a civic necessity, struck you as an important value, as did support, diversity, intellectual, community. I was interested in that outcome. Having never participated in such a poll or created a word cloud, I was very interested in the result. Tonight, I'm going to speak relatively briefly again about what Amherst values. And I want to start with what you experienced last night, or I guess it was the afternoon, yesterday afternoon. The faculty uh, were, was not here, uh, and so I will summarize. Yesterday, our new students heard a stirring speech given by Reverend Philip Jackson, class of 85. Reverend Jackson offered our new students three figures worthy of reflection, admiration, perhaps emulation. A great Chinese poet, Dao Yanming, who is remembered not only for his great poetry, but also for his understanding of the importance of idleness, the kind of idleness that is not laziness, but as our dean said today in a faculty meeting, is the art of doing nothing when nothing is what is needed. In that space of idleness, Reverend Jackson suggested we might encounter or glimpse a longer or wider horizon. We might encounter something that he called the divine or the transcendent. The second figure he offered for consideration was the American architect Samuel Mockby, who gave up a successful architecture practice to start a program at the University of Alabama called the Rural Studio. Mockby involved architecture students in the design and the building of beautiful dwellings for people in the poorest county in the United States, Hale County, Alabama. And the third figure he offered you for admiration, consideration, and reflection was this man, whose portrait hangs above me, Charles Hamilton Houston, a graduate of Amherst who developed the strategy and laid the groundwork for the eventual Brown v. Board of Education decision in the Supreme Court that ended legal segregation. And in an inspiring and rousing account of Houston's contributions, Reverend Jackson called him the best that Amherst has had, the best of us, the best of Amherst, the greatest who ever graduated. And he ended by saying of Houston and his cousin and friend William Hasty here, that they are you and you are they in promise and in determination. He asked new students, and I think the rest of us, whether we have the courage to use our gifts to make a mark on the world for good. The courage that he was interested in was not just the courage it took to achieve what these men achieved, 
but also the courage to heed a calling, to heed a calling. In the midst of doing other things, each of them heeded a calling to seek a different path and a different goal. For the poet, the encounter with what Reverend Jackson called a larger and wider horizon, or even the divine, was a death that called him home and made him realize that the economic security of a civil service job was not what he wanted to do and not the gift that he could contribute to the world. It was poetry and farming. In the case of the architect, it was seeing the grave of James Cheney, one of three civil rights workers murdered in 1964 by the Ku Klux Klan in Mississippi. And for Charles Hamilton Houston, he formulated his commitment to changing legal segregation when he experienced the virulent racism during World War I in the United States and France where he served as a military officer. And Jackson asked each of us to consider whether we would have the courage to choose a different path where we called and would we have the courage to use our gift to make a difference in the world for good. Now what interested me as much as his talk was the response from our new students and the questions that you all asked. Your questions, I thought, were a beautiful response to a very stirring talk. And I thought that I would give our faculty and other members of the audience just a sense of what questions you posed. First of all, one of our students from Hong Kong volunteered and read one of Bao Chen's poems in Chinese. One of you asked whether what Reverend Jackson called the divine is something that's intrinsic to every one of us or something acquired. Another asked how figures like Charles Hamilton Houston or Ruth Bader Ginsburg could be made better known and great, more greatly appreciated for the work they've done on behalf of civil rights. You asked how we could bring civility back to our national discussions. And one of you asked whether there are times when civility needs to take a back seat in service to a cause. You asked whether the focus on particular forms of oppression or discrimination tended to obscure the intersections among them. You asked Reverend Jackson how you would know what your gift is and also how you would know whether you were using that gift for good, whether your efforts would turn out to have been on the right side of history. He did not try to answer each of those questions, and I'm certainly not going to try to answer them, but they are questions that show your lively minds, uh, your, your sense of hope, your commitment, your engagement, and also, I thought, your optimism uh, about what can be done. He did suggest to the question about how you will know whether you're using your gift for good by saying you should let freedom, the greatest degree of freedom for the most people, be your guide. If what you're doing is, has, as the goal and the outcome, greater freedom for the greatest number of people, you will have been using your gift for good. We're beginning this semester at a very troubled time, and there's no reason um, to obscure or make light of that. Indeed, this is actually the hardest speech I've ever tried to prepare, and I don't think it's going to be adequate to the moment. I, I know that it won't be, at least not from my point of view because there is nothing for us to do, I think, given that Amherst's values are so at odds with some of what's being done and said at the national level, that what we have is the possibility and what we need to use is the opportunity 
of the conversation and the learning that is about to begin tomorrow morning. The hope that lies in our interactions with each other and in our efforts to respect and to trust one another in this community. There are a lot of historical figures, texts, poems, Reverend Jackson suggested spiritual practices that any one of us and hopefully all of us can turn to and do turn to for inspiration, for solace at troubled times, for guidance. When it comes to Amherst presidents, I have always found myself turning to Alexander Micklejohn. His portrait is in the back of the chapel, right next to the door to your right, if you're looking from my vantage point. Now, why is Alexander Micklejohn the president to whose writings I turn? I think because I find him the most intellectually interesting, because he thought about education deeply, and he thought about it in relation to larger issues and philosophical principles. I also have three institutions in common with Alexander Micklejohn. He got a PhD in philosophy at Cornell University in 1897. I did not teach and do research in 1897 at Cornell, but I did spend my, most of my academic career there. He was president of Amherst College from 1913 to 1923, and he then went to the University of Wisconsin to create an experimental college called Integrated Liberal Studies. He was adamant about the fact that a college curriculum in a liberal arts setting should provide integrated studies. Today, he's known as one of the foremost defenders of academic freedom and freedom of speech, which is one of the reasons I always turn to him. He was a member of the then National Committee of the American Civil Liberties Union. He was one of the most articulate proponents of the necessary link between freedom of speech and democracy itself. But he did not see the question of freedom of speech as an easy one. He's also known as a thinker who asked us sometimes to elevate the common good over freedom of speech. If you want an example, you can look at Justice Breyer's decision in a campaign finance case from 2000. Nixon v. Shrink Missouri Government PAC is the name of the case. And there, Breyer cited Micklejohn's interpretation of the First Amendment, emphasizing that public need, rather than individual prerogative, was the way to think about campaign finance reform. Micklejohn objected to any interpretation of freedom of speech that was focused only on freedom from constraint. He wanted us to think about freedom of speech and academic freedom in terms of what that freedom was for. What ends should it serve? And he showed the many ways in which we regulate our speech all the time in the service of community and essential norms. He then went on to suggest that the major crime the major crime against freedom of speech is actually economic necessity, the fear of bigotry, and the lack of education that prevents so many people from having their voices heard at all. I'll quote from Micklejohn. In church, in home, in office, in mill, in newspaper, in theater, these human spirits are hemmed in by custom, terrified by bigotry and taboo, driven by economic necessity, so that the honest and able thinking of which they are capable never comes into being at all. That, he wrote, is our major crime against freedom of speech. In other words, there are other principles that also matter. That is not to say that there is an easy way of assessing how those principles should, in any case, relate to one another. It's simply to complicate 
the question, which is a necessary act in my view. One of the principles that matters to Alexander Mickeljohn and has to matter to us is truthfulness. Without shared meaning, there is no structure to our relations and certainly no friendship. And this is what Mickeljohn says about truthfulness. There is, I am sure, no human virtue which goes so deeply into the making of a free society as the virtue of truth-telling. In its most essential aspects, human association is, depends upon, consists of communication. If men cannot trust the words which they speak or write to one another, the social structure collapses. If men lie, we have lost the only stuff of which human companionship can be made. We have a leader who lies as a matter of course. And in the face of that, we have to dedicate ourselves as strongly as ever, perhaps more strongly than ever, to truth seeking, which is, after all, the purpose of academic freedom and academic pursuit. What we can do is commit to our values, avow the value of truthfulness, of the pursuit of truth or its successive approximations, work together on that pursuit, respect one another's efforts in its pursuit, be honest and respectful in our interactions as we pursue it. We have a sacred responsibility to be truthful and to pursue the truth, to call out lies when we hear them, and to promote the common good. Micklejohn asks us simply to avoid thinking of freedom as an individual right exclusively, to avoid thinking of it only in the terms of what I or you as an individual can get away with, and instead to think about how we can increase access to the freedom to have one's voice heard for more people. Reverend Jackson's guidance on how to know whether you're working for good, the increase of freedom for the greatest number of people. What stands in the way of freedom of speech, in other words, is not simply prohibition, but the failure to observe other principles. At an academic institution, the freedom to pursue truth wherever it leads is our foundation. And to new students, I say to you that our teachers, our faculty, are entitled not only by this college, but by everything that matters in higher education in the United States, to full freedom in their research and in the publication of the results of that research. And they are entitled to full freedom in the classroom in discussing their subject. The American Association of University Professors, whose primary purpose it is to defend academic freedom and to give guidance on it, notes that the teachers also have a responsibility that goes with their freedom to avoid controversial matter which has no relation to their subject. There are notes clarifying that guidance, and they say this. The intent of the statement is not to discourage what is controversial. Controversy is at the heart of the free academic inquiry, which our entire statement is meant to foster. The passage serves only to underscore 
the need for teachers to avoid persistently intruding material which has no relation to their subject. College and university teachers are citizens. They're members of a learned profession. They're officers of this educational institution. But when they speak or write as citizens, they are free from institutional censorship or discipline. Their special position in the community, according to the American Association of University Professors, imposes special obligations on them to remember that the public may judge them, their profession, their discipline, their institution by their utterances, and hence they should be accurate, exercise appropriate restraint, show respect for the opinions of others, and make every effort to indicate they, they are not speaking for the institution. But apart from these forms of guidance, the rules that we follow, the procedures that we believe in, give our faculty the right to their opinions and to express those opinions outside of their field as citizens of the country. This may not um, seem as pressing or as uh, intelligible to those of you who are new students. For those of us who are uh, faculty and administrators, the, these forms of guidance are essential. What's important for you is to know that we will protect the academic freedom of our faculty in their research, in the classroom, and Academic freedom in the classroom also protects you as students. You also have rights under academic freedom and its guidance by the AAUP. This brings me back to your emphasis on friendship. It's, there's only one way for us to follow principle and guidance on principle, except to engage with each other on the things that matter, to inform each other, to be truthful, and to weigh our principles in relation to one another as carefully, as clearly, as humanely as we possibly can. I wish tonight that I could stand here and tell you what might happen, how we will respond to the things that have already happened and might happen uh, in the future, how we would weigh the principles that guide us, what decisions we would make in every case or in any particular case. I wish that were feasible. Um, in a way, I wish it. But actually, it would be assuming, A, more authority, and B, more knowledge than I have or should have. And that's why I say to you, it is really only our confidence and trust in one another and our willingness to be forthright about our principles and our goals that will allow us to come to good decisions when decisions are necessary. It's very appealing at times to come to an administration with a demand for a decision or a demand for an explanation or a demand even for apologies for the ways in which the college itself fails to live up to its own ideals. What I'm making a plea for tonight are forms of interaction and engagement with each other that put you in the position of helping make decisions and deciding some of the things that will need to be determined. Friendship is really the, as a civic necessity, is the thing that will allow us to make wise judgments. Tomorrow, it is highly likely that President Trump will announce that he is rescinding DACA, the Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals program. And as I think probably all of you know, this is a program that has allowed 
young people to pursue education and work and dreams in pursuit of what their families risked everything to provide for them in coming to the United States. And it has given them the opportunity to live in the open as they pursue that education and work and make their contributions to this country, which they have every reason to consider their own. I consider it a travesty to put the promise of hundreds of thousands of people in jeopardy to subject them to the threat of deportation and to limit their ability to make their mark the decision that may be made that has been forecast would be deplorable in my view. And I'm using this moment to urge everyone in our community, you come from everywhere in the country and the world, to contact your elected representatives and appeal to them if this decision goes in the way the president has promised to find a legislative remedy for the nearly 800,000 people who were brought to this country as children and are Americans in all but immigration status. We continue to work with Massachusetts delegations who are leading the effort to find a legislative solution. I hope that you will join in this effort to put pressure on Congress to come up with a remedy. We will keep our commitments to our students all of our students, regardless of what resources they have, regardless of their immigration status. We will meet every student's full financial need, whether that student is an American citizen, a permanent resident, an international student, or an undocumented immigrant. We will find ways to do that should federal funds be rescinded. And we will be there in other ways for our students all of our students, offering counsel, legal advice, and support. a lawfully issued subpoena or judicial order, the college will not share students' records with anyone, including immigration and customs enforcement. This is college policy, but it is also federal law. Federal privacy law prevents any one of us from providing to anyone information about a student, their whereabouts, or anything else about them. Our campus police will not inquire about anyone's legal status. They will not take part in, in actions with the immigration enforcement officers should they ever come to a campus, to our campus. I urge you to consult our website that gives more information about DACA, the program itself, and about the resources available at the college. In the face of the kind of adversity that we see, that we experience, we have to remember what we stand for. And first and foremost, we stand for the education and the welfare of our students. Every student on this campus belongs here. Every student on this campus deserves our support and deserves the support of their fellow students and their faculty, and you will get that support, everyone. This is a difficult time. It's a difficult time to be a president, I've decided. I will be the best president I know how to be with your help. And I mean that. I'm not saying um, or inviting you to be engaged with me and to take part in the discussions and the decisions that we need to make as empty rhetoric. I will do the best I can with your help and your engagement and your trust, not blind trust, but with enough trust to know that the college's values 
are values worth protecting, and we will fight to protect them. We stand against bigotry in all of its forms, against hatred. And as someone who grew up in the rural south of Virginia, who grew up in an environment that could not have been more racist, more misogynist, more homophobic, and were it 2017 in that community instead of the 1950s and 60s, more transphobic. I understand from Charlottesville and everything that led up to Charlottesville and has followed from it, the stakes in ensuring that we hold to our values, that we fight these forms of bigotry, that we recognize that a leader of our country has given license to forms of racism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, homophobia, transphobia. You know, not too many months ago, a list like that would, and probably now, evoke derision on the part of some. Yet another politically correct list. Well, you know what? It is not just a list of politically correct views or forces. It's what we stand for. We stand for the rights and the freedom for everyone, everyone who comes to this college. I, for one, even if I have to be in some other place or position to do it, will not, will not travel back down the corridor to what I experienced as a child in that part of the South. We have to fight together to avoid letting these forms of hatred, discrimination, bigotry take root. We're not going to always approach the fight in ways that are the same. We're not going to always agree about the means or about exactly what's entailed. But I can tell you only this, that that's a fight we have to all enter in whatever way we consider right, appropriate, and in accord with our principles. And the college will do everything possible to make sure we stand there with those of you who fight against the encroachment of bigotry in the United States. Thank you.